opportunity to share and finish up in James. So we'll actually continue on from where Nick left off, uh, and I'm going to just kind of follow up with the, the last chapter that James writes. Now it's in James 5 that I just kind of want to uh, compound a little bit of what Nick talked about. And it is through humility that we ought to live. James writes this letter to us as believers. When he was writing this letter, he's writing to the, the Jews of that day who had followed Jesus Christ. They had put their faith in Jesus and they wanted to live for him. And in James 5, he starts off these first six verses in, in James 5. He kind of starts to talk about the rich. Um, and he kind of almost looks on the opposite side. He's writing about rich people who are not followers of Christ. And I just want to reiterate that because as we go through it, that's going to be important for why and how James kind of closes his book. So I'm just going to read through all of five, and then we're going to come back to the beginning of five and kind of recap and just kind of walk through that. So James 5 starts off right after talking about humility and, and the things of how to treat our neighbor without boasting. Uh, and, and he gets right into, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of your laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen of the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth, for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from the death and will cover a multitude of sins. So James kind of recaps uh, a little bit of what he starts in the book of James. So James 5 is really trying to answer some of the questions that he presents at the beginning. One of the questions you first and foremost get while opening up James is, how do you get to that point where James speaks in verse 2, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete Lacking in nothing. 
How do you get to a point where you can go through and walk through suffering, trials, temptations in life and get to the point where you can praise your Lord and Father for have taken you through them? That's the, that's the question that James presents. James, at the end, puts this first six verses of this, the rich. And again, I'll, I'll go back to the, the rich he's talking about are not ones who have put their faith in Christ. But he, he starts to talk about the rich, and he talks about the issues that they have. The, the three things that I get out of the, the six verses that you see when he's dealing with the wages, the, the workers that, that are working for him. Uh, the rich in this story is somebody who is hoarding their money, somebody who is living in extravagance, and there is injustice that he is issuing to the people that work for him. It doesn't sound a whole lot different from some of the things that you guys and I entail just living in this country that there are going to be people that don't put their faith in Christ, that do live an extravagant lifestyle. Now the thing is, is as, I, as you're reading over the rich, and, and my talk really isn't about the first six verses, so I'm going to try to recap and go through this rather quickly because I really want to land on the response to the rich. Okay, So the rich people that he's talking about are people that are living in abundance, more of what they actually need. Now, living in the United States today, we could probably have an argument that a lot of us, even sitting in this room, don't have our daily needs sustained every day where at the end of the day, we have just gotten what we needed. The people that are working for these people in this time, as James is writing to them, the Christ followers are working for people, and, and it's a big deal. At the end of the day, if they don't get paid, they don't eat. Like you or I don't struggle with that. Like we have food. And if we didn't have food, we can get food. Like that's not a problem for us. In this day, if, it, think of a mother and a father trying to supply for their kids and realizing that, well, the rich guy is kind of, you know, busy, can't pay his paycheck. He doesn't give you your pay. So you go home and you don't have money to buy food for that day to even supply your kids with what they need. James is, is talking to the same sense of, of wealth that sometimes we feel like we, we kind of get wrapped up and caught up into. Now, the things about wealth that James is trying to teach us also through this is that wealth can be dangerous. And again, like we, we get the truth from the Bible, even through 1 Timothy, when it's talking about the fact that it's not money that's evil. Money is not the problem. The problem is you and I. The problem is our response to money. 1 Timothy in 6.10 talks about it's not money that's the issue, but it's the love of money. And then he continues on that when he gives a, a warning, actually in the verse before that, in verse 9, he gives a warning because he says the desire of wealth is a snare. That the things that sometimes we live for, the things that we wrap ourselves up into, doesn't often look too much different from the people who don't follow Christ. Wealth can be one of those things that blind us. If you think of that, like uh, when, when Heather and I first got married, uh, we moved to Nashville. And my thing in Nashville was like, I wanted to, to do something that I felt I had a purpose. And, and there were a lot of times where that purpose was supplying for my family. And in that supply, I thought supplying for my family was okay if you had a lot of money. Like, that should be a good thing. As a parent, you want to try to, to gain a lot of money. And, and my ultimate goal at that point was to build houses, live in them for a little bit, sell them, and, and continue to gain more wealth as I went so I had money to give my kids someday. Doesn't look a whole lot different than the American dream. In fact, that is the American dream, isn't it? Save up as much as you can so you can retire and live really, really well. And again, it's not that if you have money that this is against money. Money's not the problem. It's the fact that sometimes our purpose in life or our desire doesn't look that much different than those of people who don't follow Christ. So James is warning. Um, 
He, he makes this warning and he puts this piece in here, not because he's trying to get you to, to point the, the finger at these ungodly people and just see how evil they are. What he's ultimately doing is he's trying to show his Christian readers on the receiving end of their ungodliness and what God thinks of it. Now, this is kind of a, a common, like the way he writes is a common Old Testament uh, rhetorical nature that he writes in. And, and even in this, James is writing to his people about be cautious as a Christian to be envious of these people. Be cautious as a Christian to desire what they desire. That shouldn't be your first focal point. Proverbs uh, 38 and 9 even says, uh, it, it's kind of a prayer that I was, I was looking at, and, and this prayer says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of God. That wealth is one of those things that we talk about a lot in the Bible because it's fairly important. Because wealth has that ability to distract us and change our perspectives. I, I think of that at different times when all of a sudden, you know, you, you get out of high school and college and what's one of the things that a lot of kids want? To win the lottery. Why? Because it instantly changes your life. You don't have to wait like your parents did to where they actually have a little extra money, you know, after the kids are out of the house, right? After the kids are out of the house, that's when all the good stuff comes in. That's when the carpets actually get replaced and the furniture finally gets updated and you move on a little. And then grandkids come and then they ruin it. And then you're beyond that anyway. So when we look at wealth, there is a danger and a warning. And James is just expressing uh, there's a, a major warning. And even in verse 6, if you just look at verse 6 with me again, he says, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man. The guy he's talking about there is Jesus Christ. The people who don't think anything of Jesus Christ have already been condemned and they reject him. And everything that he has, his will, his purpose, they don't want anything to do with what Jesus wants us to do. So he continues in this. And this is where James uh, really starts to, to close his book with, hey, there's a lot of injustice in life that you and I have to deal with. And how are we to respond? How do we respond when things aren't going well for us? Well, he says it right next here in chapter 7. Therefore, be patient. Have you ever thought of dealing with difficulties in life with patience? Patience is not natural for us. Patience is not natural for our culture. I mean, think of where we've gotten. So uh, even in the, the last 20 years, I mean, think of how we first started off with fast food because cooking a meal was, took too long. Think about how we've gotten to um, drive throughs and we have gotten through uh, trying to make Everything an expressway. Everything has got to be faster because everything that's slow takes time and is boring and it seems pointless. Patience is hard for us, but patience is also what James tells us to do. Now, I just want to start off with saying that patience is not something that you just work harder at and you become more patient. Is it? Patience is something that you usually deal with because you're going through a stressful situation. Like your husband is walking through Menards or Lowe's and can't figure out what he really wants. And then he walks all the way around the whole store. See, there's some head shaking there. I, I'm guilty. And then all of a sudden you walk around the whole store only to find that you have to go back to where you started because you didn't pick up what you should have at the very beginning. And yeah, that was probably what I needed. And, and there's always that patience in life. We deal with that with our spouses, kids. We deal with that with our parents, right? Do you guys have to be patient with your parents? For sure. Especially when they're like the last ones talking at church. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Clara loves the fact that they just moved next door. And I see them all the time because with 
If, if Nick is talking a little too long, like they just boogie to the house, all of a sudden Whitney and Nick will look around and be like, ah, oh, where are the kids? Like, oh yeah, they, they're already home. They, they've been at home for the last half hour or more. Yeah, patience is hard for us. And there's a few things that James tries to point us to. He gives us this analogy of a farmer. And, and there's a couple things. Again, I, I want you to be able to write some notes down too, um, just so that way you can kind of recap this. Uh, just write a couple things down here for me if you would. Uh, but patience is the response that we are to have to trials and temptations. Under that category, you can look at patience as trusting God with what you cannot control. Trusting God with what you cannot control. And two, honor God with what you can control. Trust God with what you can't control. Honor God with what you can control. You see, patience is hard for us because things don't always go our way. Patience is most difficult when we feel like things have, ought to have gone differently. When you have a plan for the day and it doesn't go the way that it was supposed to in your mind, patience is exactly what you struggle with. Because patience also, in our pride, which goes back to chapter 4, when it is in our pride, patience goes back to telling God what we want. And thinking that our will is more important than his. And even James talks about a farmer. And some of you guys know a lot about farming, grew up, grew up on a farm, live on a farm today. Uh, maybe you just see the farmers that are out in the fields. But the way James talks about the farmer, he waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. The year we've had so far, with it being fairly dry, is a lot like what the is Israel would have all the time. If you go over to, to Jerusalem and you'd actually see some of the farmers, like super dry, right? They would have spring rains and they have late rains, and you just have to plant and make sure that it gets as much moisture as they possibly can, and you hope that there's a crop at the end of the day. The fact that you needed God to produce that crop in order to sustain you for the rest of the year was very evident in their life. They didn't have big equipment. They did a lot of stuff by hands. And a lot of the stuff that they had um, was required for them to eat all year. And again, like now we don't think of food the same way they would have thought of food. We think of food as, you know, we can just go to the fast, fast food place, go through the drive through We can quick go through the shopping grocery store, shopping mall, I'm in the wrong place, Go to the grocery store. You can pick up food rather quickly. Like, you don't have to store and, and do the same things you used to. So how many of you guys grew up uh, canning, gardening, uh, like doing food prep to like store for winter? Okay. So that's something that's kind of gone away in our culture. The younger generation, uh, unless, unless you guys have actually taught the younger generation that, they don't really know that. Because, again, we have enough food in stores that that's not really a big thing for people. It's like, hey, should I take all this time and save a little bit of money to be able to store my own food? Or uh, do I just spend a little bit more and I just go to the grocery store and I don't have to do any of that? It saves me from a whole bunch of work. We have gotten into this place of not being patient people up until the point where God doesn't want, God doesn't want us to do everything faster but he does want us to do it with the right heart. God doesn't want us to do anything faster. He does want us to do it with the right heart. Now James talks in, in a very similar language to the Apostle Paul. Uh, and actually, when you look at James, it's a very uh, contradictory book because a lot of people like to argue and fight what James is truly about. And realistically, James just reiterates and, and amplifies, exemplifies what Paul writes in a lot of his other books. Patience is something that uh, 
Paul has written in several different places. I'm going to take you to three rather quickly. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, Paul says, Therefore I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Says this again to the church of Colossae in Colossians 3, uh, 12 and 13. He says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you. And again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, he also says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. This is a common theme through, through Paul's message, through James' message, to be patient with everybody. And yet, like, that's a huge struggle for us. Even in the church. Because sometimes we don't want to be patient because we have an objective in our mind of where we think we should be. Parents, think of this when it comes to your kids. When you're trying to teach your kids something and they're not getting it right away, patience is a huge struggle for us. Luke uh, several times has uh, gotten to this ability where every morning he wakes up and he, he eats some food, whatever it may be, and then he leaves all of his wrappers around. And then I come in and say, hey, Luke, you know, are you done with all your food? Can you throw your trash away? And, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And he picks up his trash. He goes and he throws it away. And then the next day, same thing. And the next day, same thing. Next day, same thing. We've been doing this for like a year. Like, I could keep doing the same thing for like 365 times. So you guys would get bored and you guys wouldn't want to be patient. So, like, let's get to that point where, like, understand Luke is just not getting it. And as a father, like, I become impatient. And, and when you get impatient with your kids, it turns into something more forceful. It turns into a, Lucas, I'm going to grab your ears and put your head in front of mine, and I'm going to say this one more time. Throw your trash away. And, and you have this like frustration that builds out of this. Because again, patience is not something that's very easy for us. Patience is not easy because, again, we desire something different than God. Think of this as well when it comes to discipleship. When you're discipling somebody and they're just really, really slow at understanding the gospel, you're just like, how do you not get it? He died for your sins. Like, do I have to say it again? Like, yeah, you do. Be patient. It's okay. Because just as we be patient with other people, we realize how patient God has been with us. God is much more patient than we are. So I just want to uh, kind of fast forward here a little bit more. Um, I'm going to have to skip some stuff. I could go over chapter 5 for like the next hour, and I know that I'm already over time, so uh, I blame Nick. He started it. Uh, but when it comes to patience, again, I thought Nick should have been done sooner, but I wasn't very patient. So again, I struggle with patience too. Patience is something that James is really trying to, to relay to us, that patience. And then one other part that I really want to point you to, verse 8. Look at verse 8. It's a call, you too be patient. It says, strengthen your hearts. Uh, the other, uh, some of the other versions of the Bible talk about standing firm. What does it look to stand firm in your heart? Well, standing firm, again, when we're patient, doesn't mean that we just do nothing. James isn't trying to point Christians to inactivity. James is trying to point Christians to staying on point. Just the way the farmer does, right? The farmer would not have a harvest if he didn't plant, if he didn't cultivate. And then it's got to get to harvest. There, there, there's this ability to, to understand that farmers are very, very busy. A lot. There's a lot of work to do. And yet, there's still a patience because you have no idea what's going to happen. You have no idea what the weather's going to do. It's the same way that G James is speaking about this in chapter 4. 
when he's reiterating, you, you think that you know what you're going to do tomorrow, but you don't. You're a vapor. You're a mist. We still, as Christ followers, don't just sit back and just wait for God to do everything for us. He wants us to participate with him, which is also why he calls us to work for him, to serve him in that way. Again, it doesn't mean that we work and we serve for our salvation. We work and serve because of what God has already done for us. And just in that same way, James is trying to close this book and he points to even, look at the Old Testament. Be patient and endure. Look at Job. He says, look at Elijah. You have a couple different people who are following what God wants them to do. And even Job doesn't get the answers to his life. Job doesn't get all the answers to his suffering. What he does get is he gets a clear picture of you are to follow me. Trust God. If you, have, if you knew all the answers, if you had all the answers, you wouldn't need to trust God. You would just know. Faith would be non-existent. You wouldn't have to have faith if you knew everything God knew. The reason why faith is required is because you and I don't know what God has. He knows everything. We don't. So it's even among this that, uh, again, as, as James 5 is closing up, um, he's talking about Job. He's talking about Elijah. He's talking about sticking to truth. Verse 12, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. He's pointing you to stick to truth. And then he also ends at the very end after he's talking about being patient and endure with how do you do this? Um, He says, pray. If I asked you a question, do you pray enough? I would assume every single one in this room would say no. And that doesn't mean that some of you aren't great prayer warriors. That just means that we always feel like we can talk to our Father more. And he says, pray. If you're suffering, then pray. If you're cheerful, then sing praises. If any one of you is sick, pray with the elders. Doesn't mean that there's anything special with the elders. What it does mean is that you're praying when you're hurting, you're praying when you're happy, You're praying with the elders. You're praying with your church. And then he also says, because it's the Lord that will raise you up. And if there's anything in life that you can remember, you can be suffering or going through a trial or or something drastic in your life. And God may take your life But understand, when you put your faith in Him, He forgives sins. He's the one who essentially you understand and have hope in all of eternity. That this life is a vapor and a mist. This life is short. We may not think so, but this life is going to be super short. I'm sure some of you who are older, and Sharon, I'm sorry, I looked right at you. I'm not trying to, this is, (laughs) there's a few of you that are a little older than me. And just wanted to, you would probably say that in life, life has gone super fast. Yeah. This life is so fast. Don't look around you at other people and wish for what they have. Don't look at the rich people in your life and say, oh, hey, if I had money, everything would be fixed. Because they don't have a forgiveness of sins is what James is describing to this group. That's more important than anything else. If you, get, if you walk away from this conference and get nothing else out of this, I would, I would hope and pray that James would point you to the fact that you don't need to do more in life. You don't need to work harder. You need to spend more time and trust him. The work part that James talks about comes out of that. But when you spend more time with Christ, with your heavenly Father, he takes all of those worries away. He reassures you and lets you understand and know that our life is so short 
that the only thing that is worthy in our life is to understand his will, that someday judgment will come, that the day of the Lord is coming. There is a new kingdom. We're not, to me, we're not meant to live for this earth, but we're meant to live for God's kingdom who's coming. Would you guys just close with me in prayer? Dear Father, I just pray and ask right now that you would just help all these women that have come to this conference to, to look at your scripture, to look at your word. And I know that everyone in this room is at different places in life. There are people that are going through temptations and trials and they are enduring well. And there are people that are doing, going through temptations and trials and they feel like they're getting hit by wave after wave after wave. And I just pray and ask that you would help us to focus on you because there's nothing more important in this life than you. That it's not about how much we can accomplish, how fast we can accomplish it, how much money we can leave for our kids. Our purpose and goal in life is to see you as the only one who came and died on the cross for our sins. That we all fall short, we all struggle, and we all need you. We know that trials and temptations point us to trusting in you more. And we just ask that you would just help us today to just give in to that. Help us to trust you and not trust in ourselves, not trust in our own wisdom, not trust in our own strength, not be proud, but humbly come to a place where we understand that we need you. We desperately need you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.